The thing I will never forget is the excitement of that first day's writing, of typing those words, so now get up, and what followed. And that carried me through a great deal of adversity. Welcome to the Waterstones podcast and our new series, How We Made. In these episodes, we look at the story behind books which went on to become prize winners, trailblazers, or are now seen as modern classics. What was going through the author's mind when they first sat down to write them? Was their path to success as smooth as it seems? And what was it like to be part of the team to first bring them to readers? In this first episode, we look at Wolf Hall, the book which began a literary phenomenon culminating in a trilogy of novels which now stand as the benchmark for what historical fiction can achieve. With the whole series now available in paperback, we spoke with Dame Hilary Mantel about where her interest in Thomas Cromwell came from, how she fictionalised his life so engagingly, winning the Booker Prize twice, and how she feels now looking back on a 15-year project. This is How We Made Wolf Hall. For much of this episode, you will hear from Hilary Mantel herself and from her editor at Fourth Estate, Nicholas Pearson. When I had last spoken to Hilary on the publication of The Mirror and the Light, I had asked her where the impulse to write about Cromwell had come from. This time, I wanted to go back as far as I could, to the first inkling of what we would come to know as Wolf Hall. I have to go right back to the beginning of my writing career, when I was 22 and I decided I was going to write a huge novel about the French Revolution, and I was going to set out my stall as a historical novelist. I knew that a place of greater safety would take me many years, but I did intend it to be the beginning of something, not a one-off. And I saw myself just as a historical novelist. I didn't think I was very good at making things up, so I thought I need the guidelines of history, which was a little naive, really, because (laughs) I didn't quite realise how much the historical record, as we call it, is a patchwork of invention. And I didn't realise how much would always be missing and require the aid of an informed imagination. But I saw myself as a historical novelist and it was very simple in my mind. I shall do this and then I shall move on to Thomas Cromwell. And I guess I'd been interested in him since my school days because when I was taught... I I studied the Tudors for A-level. And I, in fact, even before that, I think we had a little interval of Tudor history, as children do. And when I heard about the dissolution of the monasteries, Cromwell's masterwork, I thought, what a good idea. Um, How smart. I want to meet the man who masterminded this. But it's frustrating because there was nothing to read. I found exactly the same as a young girl when I became interested in Henry VII. There weren't the, the popular biographies. And a gap there, admirably filled since by historians, but Cromwell, not quite the same, because what I did find about him was so black and it seemed to relate to not a person at all, but to a caricature. And you you feel that there is another case to be posed and a great deal to find out. And I just wanted to know what kind of person he was and History wasn't delivering me that. And there are two Cromwells, really. The one in popular history, who's the black cloak villain, and the one in academic history, who's brilliant and a genius. 
But of course, academic historians aren't necessarily interested in what kind of person you have here. What they do know is about the centrality of Cromwell to Henry's reign, which I myself began to grasp as I pushed on investigating the material. So it goes way, way back into my life. And then I I promised the book to Fourth Estate. I signed a two-book contract after I've finished my novel Beyond Black. Uh, two novels, one of which required no research, and the other was Thomas Cromwell. Mm. And that was a case of, I'll see you in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so naturally, I began on the one that required no research. And I didn't get stuck exactly. It was that the material overwhelmed me. It was extremely powerful. And I I felt, as you do in the closing stages of the book, that it, it was somehow consuming me, and yet I was only working on the opening chapters. And it was an unhappy situation, really, and I'm not sure if I shall ever write that novel. And so I thought one day, well, I'll just sit down and see how Thomas Cromwell sounds. And immediately I wrote the opening words. Everything changed. My whole working life changed. I grasped it by a sort of instinct. All the time that the project had been in my head, I suspect it had been taking on a life of its own, completely independent of any research I was doing. So from the first line, the book sounded confident and as if it knew what it was about. So does that mean that you, when you literally sat down to write the first words of Wolf Hall, those very, very famous first words, that those were the first words that you wrote, that it, that it came straight out like that and, and just kept moving? The words were going around in my head all day. Hmm. And I sat down, put them on the screen, and then the whole picture, as it were, resolved about me. And as I've said before, sometimes all the important decisions about a book are taken in the space of a breath. Because what I could see, you had the young Cromwell lying on the floor and his father is kicking him and the boy thinks, any minute I'm going to die. And what he can see in very close focus is simply his father's boot and the stitching in the boot and his own blood. And the immediacy and the intimacy of it was what took me by surprise. There was no question where we were. It's as if my head was on the cobbles right next to, to Cromwell's. I wasn't exactly behind his eyes, but I was almost occupying his body as if there was a cloudy overlap. It couldn't be a first-person narrative for sound technical reasons. But it was a very close third person narrative. And of course, when you see something like that in cinematic detail, what is the time? Well, the time is now. This is not something we narrate with the luxury and consideration of the past tense. We are seeing this unfold and we don't know where we'll go. Maybe he's going to die. He doesn't know. We don't know. We don't even know who he is. And at that moment, he's lost all sense of self. All he has is the need to survive. So now get up. Feld, dazed, silent, he has fallen. 
knocked full length on the cobbles of the yard. His head turned sideways. His eyes are turned towards the gate, as if someone might arrive to help him out. One blow, properly placed, could kill him now. Blood from the gash on his head, which was his father's first effort, is trickling across his face. Add to this, his left eye is blinded. But if he squints sideways with his right eye, he can see that the stitching of his father's boot is unravelling. The twine has sprung clear of the leather, and a hard knot in it has caught his eyebrow and opened another cut. So now get up. Walter is roaring down at him, working out where to kick him next. He lifts his head an inch or two and moves forward on his belly, trying to do it without exposing his hands, on which Walter enjoys stamping. What are you, an eel? his parent asks. He trots backward, gathers pace, and aims another kick. It knocks the last breath out of him, thinks it may be his last. His forehead returns to the ground. He lies waiting for Walter to jump on him. The dog, Bella, is barking shut away in an outhouse. I'll miss my dog, he thinks. She sent me 40, 50 pages, which became the first pages of Wolf Hall and asked me what I thought. Did I think she had the voice? And I read those pages, and I sometimes the, the job of an editor is actually quite simple, because I just thought, yes. Those, those first, that first line, so now get up, and on it goes, um, um, had me completely hooked. So my job was very simple. My job was to say to Hillary, crack on. It was an unusual process for me because when I had written the first section um, or maybe a couple of sections, I then showed it to my publisher. Normally, I would hold back for far longer, but I wanted them to know how the book sounded. And... I have to say that I did feel very confident in it from that first few paragraphs. I had a feeling of having arrived home that I was now doing the work that I had been preparing for and that the previous books had been like going to the gym. Um, everything had been leading up to writing this one and it's very fortunate if an author feels you know the timing timing counts for such a lot in an author's career and if you try to write a book prematurely it has a forced feel about it because the fact that you um, know the story doesn't necessarily mean you have explored the themes and so you may not be ready psychologically to write that book and also there's the danger that projects go off the boil you when you stack them up in the way I do you you can go past them and sometimes you have to say well with regret I'm going to let that one go because I'm no longer the same person every book changes you you don't come to your next project the same person as you were three, four years back. And I think this experience came out of the long preparatory period. By the time I finally sat down to it, I was thoroughly ready to write it. I didn't know everything I needed to know. Um, there was still a mountain of research to do. but. Cromwell and I were able to look each other in the eye, which I don't think would have been the case at an earlier stage of my career. Writing for me is always a swift process, 
but there's a lot of reworking and of course the research which had to be done stage by stage you can't to my mind do all the research and then move on to a phase of writing because until you come to write a particular scene you don't know what you need to know yeah. And you don't know the possibilities in there. So research is something that unfolds creatively along with the writing. And as my knowledge deepened, then I seized on the complexities. And, of course, unexpected things happen because in my vision of the book... Cromwell's patron and mentor, Cardinal Woolsey, would have made an exit within 50 pages. Mm. But as soon as Woolsey arrived on the page in the, in the second scene of the book, which propels us ahead to find Cromwell in early middle age, as soon as Woolsey sat down and began to talk. All I had to do was listen. And I was completely enchanted by the Cardinal. Our hmm. people were in his lifetime and he wasn't going anywhere. And I realised then how central this relationship was to Thomas Cromwell's life. Was he actually disappears from view at an early stage as Cromwell builds his career. But he never stops thinking about Wolsey. He never stops talking about him. And the lessons he learned from the Cardinal last him for life. This was a surprise to me too. Um, and of course, when I began, I I thought in terms of Woolsey out in 50 pages and Anne Boleyn in and a book that can cover Cromwell's whole career. But then the whole thing flowered out from the middle <laughs> and I realised, oh, this is two books. And then in the course of time, this is three. I got an email from Hillary saying, Nicholas, I've written 220,000 words or whatever it was um, and I'm a long way from the end but I think what I have is a is, is a novel to itself will you read it and I happen to be going to Australia for work um, a, a few days later so I printed it off and I read that manuscript much of it on an aeroplane going to Australia and in fact I finished it in incredibly hot sunshine um, at the back of a beach in Adelaide, <laughs> um, where I was escaping from a, from a literary festival just for an afternoon. It was a very odd place to read what is, in, I mean, a very expansive book about Tudor England, but there's a sort of claustrophobia to it as well, to read it in the great open expanse of Australia. Mm. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is, yeah, this is, this is fantastic. Of course, it's a novel to itself. I was trying to live with him and walk in his shoes and speak as I find. Mm. And it's a pragmatic reaction on the author's part, which suits the figure of a pragmatic man who is always saying, what's going to work here? What outcome do I want? How do I get to it? Mm. Rather than proceeding on a set of principles that other people have created. I had to do the same as an author, take it situation by situation. Undoubtedly, it comes out more sympathetic to Cromwell than many historical accounts. But I'd like to think that that's not because I'm quarrelling with them. It's just because I've thought about him from the inside and inevitably I've looked at the world through his eyes and so that changes the story from the familiar one. I remember being on the floor of my office um, 
with my then assistant packing proofs of Wolf Hall into envelopes and sending them to many, many writers and um, and being very excited about that, putting that book. Cause, but at that point, Hillary had had a fantastic reputation, not incredible sales. Her sales were sort of up, up and down. Mm. But it, this felt like an absolute shift. And then a few weeks later, when when writers got diet. Diane Atthill, um, for example, got back to me. I, I thought, yes, I think I'm right. I think this really is what I think it is. I know other people, other people see it as well. So the, the vindication, in a way, sort of came quite early on, and then the reviews, of course, and then the, and then the sales. Publication day comes. You put something out into the world, and you don't have any control over it any longer. Mm. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't even belong to Hillary to a certain extent. It becomes everybody's, and and um, you lose control. You lose control of things, and you just have to wait and see what happens. But these great, great books have got precisely what they've deserved, and an incredibly enormous readership, which is wonderful. This is one of the key things about any book's major success, of course, finding a wide readership. But for books which seem to inhabit a genre, it means appealing to readers who don't usually read that sort of thing. To understand more about where that interest came from, I spoke to fiction category manager at Waterstones, B. Carvalho. So I was a, a bookseller at Waterstones Hampstead um, when, when Wolf Hall first came out and um, there was just an absolutely extraordinary buzz around it. Um, I was quite a new bookseller and hadn't really experienced that for a literary novel at that time. Um, it just seemed like every customer coming through the doors had heard about it and wanted to read it and it was very much not restricted to any particular kind of kind of reader um feels like mantel doesn't isn't an author who can be pigeonholed into a particular genre really um wasn't just fans of historical novels who were coming in looking for it it is historical but it's also very contemporary in its feel and definitely appeals almost to readers of thrillers with that the her pacing and the kind of tension that she um she has in her writing it was just amazing having so many people of all different tastes kind of wanting to talk about this one book. So much so that I, I bought myself a copy that first week. I've still got the first edition on my shelf next to subsequent editions of it. There was just such excitement. And that excitement has carried on through the years, through the, the prizes and um, the adaptations. And um, I mean, we had the launch of The Mirror and the Light um, about a year ago. Um, and it's really extraordinary when a book release kind of becomes a major news story and you know people outside of the industry are, are kind of aware of that as a as a cultural moment it's quite rare really um and it's super exciting and it's just been an incredible thing to work on both on the shop floor and and throughout the years so i think taken as a whole they are about the making of modern modern england and I think there is, there's undoubtedly, um, of course, there's tremendous interest in that. I mean, they these books happen to have been put out into the world at, at a time of great change in this country over the last ten years. I think that's helped as well. And they're just they're very very Im immersive. I mean, this this voice she has found for. Cromwell. Or, I mean, as a reader, you sit sort of crouched at the back of Cromwell's skull, I think, or somewhere on his shoulder, watching things unfolding around him. And that is a very, very powerful and immersive experience, reading experience. I think with every book, whether it is a pure literary novel or it inclines towards genre, you just write the very best you can. And it's as simple or as complicated as that. Mm. And so I would never, you know, the worst thing in the world is to get above yourself and think you should simplify things for your readers or you should write down. You, mm. you must never condescend to your reader and you, you must always take your reader to be intelligent and committed. I think the the Wolf Hall trilogy asks a lot of its readers. And readers have given me that back. They've shown immense commitment to the books. 
as have the publishers, as have the booksellers. And it's as if you give a lot, you'll get a lot back from readers. Mm. And I never simplified, I never scanted. I took all the trouble that was necessary and I took the time that was necessary too. And of course, a lot of people were rather agitated about that because of the gap between the um, the second and the third novels. And they were urging me on. And occasionally I would get wonderful letters from people who would say, I am 90, could you please get on? <laughs> <laughs> and I would write back and explain that I was going with such expedition as was humanly possible while at the same time serving the subject matter properly. Uh, and, of course, people forget that books are not mechanically produced. Authors have a life. And in a way, you know, success is a block because the first novels were such big hits that um, they... They bred a lot of business by themselves. And despite all that, despite getting involved in writing a play and so on, the main factor that held back the mirror and the light was the sheer complexity of the material. And my increasing feeling that I respected all the characters in the book. And I was their humble servant, and I wanted to do well by them. Not just Cromwell himself, but Henry and all the people in the book. I didn't, I didn't ever want to sell them short. A mention of the play there, and this is another fascinating aspect of Wolf Hall. Having spawned TV and theatre adaptations as the trilogy was being completed, I have always been intrigued by the idea of how the different mediums may have interacted and even influenced each other. Hilary, of course, was perfectly placed to tell me more. I think everything I write, every page of every book, has got a film inside it and also a play inside it. And if there's one thing I regret about my career it's that I didn't get involved with the theatre earlier. That was really mostly to do with my health, which isn't great. And as you know yourself, theatre is a high-energy pursuit. Mm. And if, as a writer, you're there in the rehearsal room, you need to be able to keep up with the team. It's this team effort, and that's very refreshing, but it's also testing. Mm. And I think my my prose is always yearning away, as if it were straining <laughs> away from the page. On the one hand, it wants to be all dialogue. On the other hand, it wants to be all pictures. Yeah. And, you know, I like films um, that are very, very sparing of words where the image does a great deal of work. So I have all these ideals in my mind and you can't fulfil them all on the page. So it's just magic to have the opportunity to be involved. And I found, particularly with the play, um, there, were, there were two plays of, of the first two books, which Mike Poulton wrote, but it was a very collaborative process. And by the time the players had gone through various iterations and they'd moved on from the West End to Broadway. It was very much a joint project and, in fact, we were credited as joint authors at that stage. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of my Tony nomination. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and um, yes, it was a creative process because in the rehearsal room, I'd always have two notebooks. One was for my notes for that day and the other was for the ideas that were bouncing around for the third book. Mm. And it became a, a wonderful process of interaction with the actors themselves. And particularly Ben Miles, who played Thomas Cromwell, so that now as we move on to the adaptation of the third book, Ben and I have written that play together. Um, and that has been my main work of this last year. So the whole thing, walking into a rehearsal room for the first time, it was an injection of vitality to my own process. It was the best thing that could have happened at that point because in what turned out to be a 15-year project, you could get very lost and very lonely. And the sheer fun and the refreshment of working with other people was something that propelled the third book and always looking forward to um, to the adaptation process. And I found it helped me technically as well because there are some very complex scenes in The Mirror and the Light. There's a lot of information to convey. So I would say to myself, what would you do if you had to put this on stage? And say you've got two characters and you're going to give them three lines of dialogue each. What's the essence of this situation? What is the core idea that the audience has to grasp? And also, how does this help the next scene take off? Mm. And so with that in mind, I was able to cut through some of the complexities. Of course... The book then becomes a very leisurely form of theatre in that you have the time and space to play that scene out properly. But a lot of the maxims that you would use in the theatre still apply. And I suppose the other thing is that in rehearsal and watching performance, I became so aware of the wordless negotiations caused by the way people move in a space, the power play, how it can be indicated by the spaces between people, and the way they move through a space relative to each other. So I started storyboarding. So... Again, when I had a very complicated scene, I wouldn't just think, what do they say? I'd just think, where do they say it from? And I wouldn't, of course, necessarily tell the reader, then he gets up and goes and looks out of the window. But it would be in my mind and it would help me grasp what was really going on in that room. Another key part of the triumph of Wolf Hall was winning the Booker Prize in 2009. The fact that its sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, won the prize too in 2012 makes all this success seem rather inevitable. So much so that it was a long-standing joke that nobody would want to be nominated for the prize when the concluding part of the trilogy was finally published. But what was the feeling in the room that night in October in London's Guildhall? The way I protect myself in those situations like Booker Prize is just to assume... Um, however good the, the novel that you're involved with is, that, that you're not that you're not going to win. <laughs> Otherwise, she could only be disappointed. But when she got the nod, um, I was just very, very happy for her. Totally delighted, obviously. I was out of that seat as if I'd been shot out of a cannon. There was no um, modesty or grace <laughs> involved. I was on that stage in a flash. Um it was a curious thing. I, in the moments after I'd had 
um, the handover of the prize, I felt as lonely as I've ever felt in my life. The hall empties and you're left on stage with technicians trying to get you to instantly broadcast and you look down and this hall that was so crowded with expectant faces, suddenly there's no one there. And you know how it is with a theatre, how the energy just drains out of a room. Mm. And there I am on the stage with the technicians and they're trying to get me through to America and the line's not working and they decide it's my fault and they start <laughs> shouting at me and I start shouting back at them and I look down and there's no one there they've all gone to celebrate <laughs> and um it was the last thing I expected I felt so alone in that moment and then someone came and said in my ear do you know at this moment you're selling faster than Dan Brown <laughs> and I said good god it's not the Olympics <laughs> <laughs> um the um the ire <laughs> that overtook me um I was, I suppose, being inducted into a new world in which I was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was an item, as it were. Um, I was there to be bought and sold. And it was extremely alienating. And then, you know, um, I don't know if I'm the only pro book prize winner who's gone through the evening without alcohol, but I'm very <laughs> conscious I had to get up for a breakfast television. And, you know, I always have to think first about conserving my energy. So celebrations were rather muted. I went on to HarperCollins' party um, in central London and went back and prepared for the morning. That was, um, it seemed to me that it was just, you know, work. Celebrations can come later, but you've got to keep a tight rein on yourself. You have a lot to do the day after the Booker Prize. You're doing more or less back-to-back -back press interviews and media all day. When it came to the second win, all that experience was very handy. <laughs> um, it was a different sort of occasion the second time. It felt rather more low-key. Um, it's, it's hard to say why, really, but I suppose I thought the chances that I would win twice were, were not great. Um, and on the second occasion, I was feeling so ill that night. And part of me just was saying, please let me go home. <sighs> but of course, when the prize is handed to you, you um, you forget such things for the moment. and you, The exhilaration of it carries you along. And then it, that exhilaration has to propel you through a great deal because you have been handed a certain responsibility then and you, you're very conscious that it's up to you to work productively and creatively with the book trade. Mm -hmm. I have had the most wonderful backing all, all the way along from booksellers. And... Not just in this country either, but um, worldwide. And again, that's a good feeling because it makes you part of a team, even though in this last year it's a team you never see. And so with the trilogy of novels now in paperback, two Booker Prizes and plenty of other accolades on the shelf, TV and theatre adaptations winning further plaudits, how does the author responsible for such a cultural impact feel looking back on it all? The thing I will never forget is the excitement of that first 
day's writing, of typing those words, so now get up, and what followed. And that carried me through a great deal of adversity, because as I mentioned, the, the author is not a mechanical force, but has a life. Towards the end of Wolf Hall, um, as I was writing Thomas More's trial, my husband took very ill, um, had emergency surgery, and I almost lost him. Between Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies, I myself was in the hospital for a long time and very ill. Um, there was always a resilience about the project itself that carried me through. The characters were strong, the narrative was strong. The dialogue was packed with energy. No matter how I felt, the, the books were pulling me along. And I feel grateful. They were life-changing. Obviously, they were career-changing. Mm. But there's something um, that simply charges you up. When you arrive at that moment in your career, when you sit down and say, right, now we'll see what I can do. Um, before this... I composed little occasional pieces. Now I'm going to write a symphony. Hmm. It's that kind of feeling of surging power. And you have to negotiate your way to that position. Because I was always a writer who had a good press, but I didn't sell many books. With Beyond Black, the book previous to the trilogy, I'd done reasonably well in terms of sales. And I, I thought it was a time that I could say to my publisher, I'll be back in a while. Um, I could set my stall out for a big project. In other words, I had to earn the right to create the Wolf Hall trilogy. Mm. Um, I didn't want that feeling that I was walking into a career wilderness and I didn't have that. My my publishers were very encouraging. They had a lot of faith in me. No one's ever hovered over this project or said, let's have a look at what you're up to. And, um, and particularly that was important during the writing of the last book when we all needed immense patience. And I got that um i got the help i needed you know really when you get to the stage with your writing where you you know what you're doing on a technical level what you want often is just reassurance you want someone to say keep going you don't want someone hovering over every comma um my publishers have I've always understood the way I work. I do a lot of editing of my own. And I also consider my relationship with my editors very important. Um, you do need, at, at some stage, you, you need to be able to shout for help if you need it. And I knew I always could. She hasn't needed... Uh, much help from me she's she's being very modest and very kind there but really as I, as I've already said you know, sometimes publishing is quite easy when somebody is working at this sort of level your job is to just keep encourage encouraging them but mm. also to be patient this is a project that lasted how long did it last in the end 15 years something like that um and um uh, so I, I was just in the background. Uh, we, I'm very, I've become very, very fond of Hillary. It's a friendship as well as a professional re, um, relationship. So I just did my best to be there 
um, for her when when she needed me in what in 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 whatever form. I'm rather sad. It's in what on one level it's all over. I mean, the the, the job as a publisher never stops. It's um, now we now have to look after these great books, and we've got the paperback to come any minute now. But there's a little bit of sadness with me that um, when when the mirror and the light. Um, was finally published because it's just been to be frank an incredibly enjoyable adventure for all of us at fourth estate which we're very you know we're very proud of it um, um but now the now now a new journey for hillary which we're very excited about whatever that journey is we will all be very excited to see where hillary mantel takes us next but until that time we have the cromwell trilogy and indeed an incredible backlist of other books to keep us entertained and thrilled huge thanks to her editor Nicholas Pearson, and all at Fourth Estate, and also to B. Carvalho at Waterstones. How We Made returns next week with an episode which takes us inside a book so expansive it is quite literally a handbook to life, the universe, and everything. Don't panic, it's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. See you then.